Hello and welcome to the Exponential Potential podcast, helping you thrive in times of change with your hosts, Claire Oatway and Jennifer Evans, aka Zengen, along with expert guests sharing with you uplifting, inspiring and insightful stories, groundbreaking, rule-shaking ideas, fresh, new, exciting perspective, and truly transformational tools and top tips, as well as generous gifts for you, our listeners, on an array of topics, all designed to help you thrive in all areas of life. So sit back and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next edition of Exponential Potential, um, where we start to look at the different strategies and approaches that people can take to thrive in these times of great change. Um, And today I am joined by John Harvey um, from his kitchen table, which is just Mm. delightful. He's not very often at his kitchen table. We'll explain why in a moment. He's often out and about. Um, across the southwest of the UK and John is a business owner he's a speaker he's also an author and a founder of the Sunfire Club and we'll be digging into some of those but hey John how are you welcome welcome thank you very much for having me I'm very well it's Monday morning Monday is normally my work from home day so this is the one day of the week where I normally do sit at the kitchen table and I feel like you should explain why I've said that you're very rarely at your kitchen table. <laughs> Where else are you? <laughs> um, I um, I was. People say to me, "Where do you live?" Um, which is a question I get asked a lot, which sounds terrible. I'm a nomad, so I work wise. I cover the southwest of England, which is Bristol all the way down to Cornwall. Nominally, that's a word, isn't it? I have a cottage in Penzance, which is gorgeous, but. I'm probably there what, once a week tops. Um, I stay with my sister's house, which is where I'm here. If I'm up this end of the country, I stay in hotels a lot. Um, I literally move around a lot for work reasons. <laughs> the, the tension is building, the surprise <laughs> um, so in, in terms of in terms of what you do and the impact you have on mm. yeah, on the planet, really. Uh, kind of you've described yourself as helping organizations and and individuals to harness the power of networking and learn to enjoy it now for many of my listeners networking is such a dirty word and it kind of strikes fear almost as much as public speaking and I'm guessing that you're often the nomad because you are spending your time actually doing what you describe and encourage others to do Indeed, uh, I spend I spend my time either hosting events, so my own events, or attending other people's events. Or if I'm not doing that, I will be spending time with members of the Sunfire Club, whether that be corporate members or individual members. Quite often, it's just having a cup of coffee and a catch up, and just do you know what? A lot of it is listening and offering. Bit of advice here and there, but most of it, it's very, it's a bit similar to being a coach or a mentor, etc. As long as you can learn to say "aha," uh-huh, and how does that make you feel? You're fine. No, but on a serious and note, it, a lot of it is listening. And um, you yeah, know, disclosure point: I'm a member of the Sunfire Club, and and one of the reasons why I joined is that it didn't feel like a networking group that I'd ever come across. Can you? Can you describe what it is and, and why you'd set it up? Uh, okay, in order, what is it? It is, I describe it these these days, I describe it as a community of like-minded individuals, organisations, um, who genu- who buy into the ethos of the club, which is be nice. It sounds very simplistic. Be nice, sell, support each other, look after each other. Um, selling is absolutely discouraged and I'm sure that's why a lot of people um, don't like networking per se because they think it's about selling or they've been pitched at at networking events Um, so it's a very friendly supportive community which is growing all the time and the second part of the question was now absolutely can't remember what was the second part of the question Claire help me out here what inspired you to start it um it was 
necessity, my last paid role came to an end. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I I always say it was a midlife crisis. It came out of um, a conversation with various people. Um, but to be honest, I had never envisaged working for myself or um, having a business. But some bright spark said, you know everybody and you should monetize it. Um, given that I never take an introducer's fee or I never take a cut of anything that comes out of things that I put together. I don't know how you can monetize that. And then the conversation switched to where's the best networking, et cetera. Um, and it just, the idea just sort of fermented. And then literally I thought I would do it for one year and then go and get a proper job. So it was going to be a gap year. And that was six years ago. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> That was a very grand so, plan. My business plan for year one was don't run out of money. It was that simple. <laughs> to be honest, kind of, we can overcomplicate things by adding on and adding on and adding on. And um, one of the things that one of the things that I love about the club, and I don't do it enough um, actually, but I love the the energy around um, it. Be, it feeling like. Uh, well, you described it as a private members club. It's feeling like a private members club, a sort of, you know, kind of like a really close community, but people who genuinely care about what's going on in each other's lives. You know, it's just yeah. it's that real warmth. Mm. Yeah, it, and people comment on that a lot. And um, I think, I, I don't know is the answer. I, 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 if you ask, I think, though, that it comes from the culture, getting the culture right. Um, and reinforcing that culture so we have whatsapp groups um, and people engage all the time in there but if anybody puts anything in there that is deemed too salesy whatever i don't have to police that anymore it self polices and they all jump on it um mm. it is but equally i think we all have as humans because we're social animals a great desire to belong to something whether that be a community a tribe Call it whatever you want, but back in caveman days, we all had to be in tribes to survive. So I think it I think it appeals to something very primeval in all of us. Mm. And you described how kind of many people, let alone members, are put off by networking done badly, where it's just a, a sales. And I, I've got to you know describe kind of my some of my initial feelings walking into rooms is you don't know anybody. Um, you're just going to get sold photocopiers or sold stuff that you don't want. It's really hard to strike up a conversation as a newbie and you just freeze. Um, is is that what many people that talk to you share? Absolutely. Um, myself included. I can remember going to my first Chamber of Commerce lunch back in Cornwall, Blue, be over 10 years ago now, and it was very much like the first day at boarding school. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. It is not a natural thing to do to walk into a room full of strange people. I mean, it's just not a natural thing to do. And let alone then start a conversation with a stranger. I mean, I think fear of rejection come, will come into it for sure. Um, no, it's, it's you know, and I know very senior people who have been around a long time who still get very, very nervous about networking or going into a room full of strangers um i myself you know i was at an event in bristol recently 500 people in a room of which i probably knew half a dozen at best um i was nervous it, it happens to all of us it's normal yeah yeah and is that part of the reason for writing the book you know the, the full it's probably going to be backwards but for the love of networking was that part of the reason why you chose to so um, originally the idea for writing the book came out of like most things came out of a conversation i was having a coffee in plymouth funny enough which i think is where you're from with somebody called julian summerhays and we were having a catch-up and he said john you should get on the speaker circuit because you'd be really good and i went i would love to be on the speaker circuit because i think that would be i'm a frustrated performer i should have gone to stage school um, and he said, if you want to get on the speaker circuit, you need to write a book. He said, that's how you get on. You don't make money from business books, from the book sales, but it leads to other things. It validates what you do. Um, so that's that's why I wanted to write it. And that was years ago. Um, and then he then put me into, into, he connected me with people in Bristol who knew Sue Richardson. We'll give her a plug. 
Um, she is one of very few business publication authors, not authors, what I'm saying, publishers. Um, lovely. And it came from there. I invested the money because it's not cheap. Um, and then didn't write it because, I, to be fair, I wasn't ready. With hindsight, I didn't. I wasn't ready. It wasn't in the right space. Um, and it was lockdown when we were stuck that I had the time and space. So that's when I actually finally wrote the damn thing. But for me, it's validation. So when people go, John, I've heard all about you. Are you, you know, are you really this expert? And I go, sweetie, I'm bloody published. Okay, it's on Amazon. Shush. <laughs> No, and I'm tell- I can't tell you how I'm so I'm so precious, but I love being able to say that. I'm going unpublished, darling. Mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah. Uh, another thing about uh, John is he is absolutely outrageous and if you do watch us on video do because there are it's even more funny to watch um but you describe in the um, on the front cover is how to put successful networking at the heart of your business and life and I love that sense of um of heart of loving of that connection that does not feel like a transaction is is that where you think we need to make a mind shift, shift, mindset shift. Absolutely, absolutely. There are there are lots of. I mean, there are other networking or other business clubs out there, um, um, and some of you know, and they're not bad either. Some of them are very good, but essentially, if it's purely business based, then they are tend to be very transactional. People want to network for business development. You know, extrapolate that out. They want sales. Um, so, I mean, selling will cut sales will probably, or I call it business rather than sales, rather than new business. Business or work will come from relationships, but you have to build those relationships first. Um, and equally, the reason I say put it at the heart of your business and your life, I think I do, is everything you need in life will come from your network. If you invest time um, and energy in building a network, it will look after you for life. And I'm, you know, and a good example would be in your network, you should have a builder, a plumber, an electrician. Now they're not traditionally well not business, but they will those kind of things. You need those kind everything should be in your network. If your networks, you know, if you invest in it, you I, you're never more than six degrees, you know, you can get to anyone in six steps. Literally. And the lovely thing about the Sandfire community now is. In the WhatsApp group every day, you will see people asking, you know, questions or putting in requests for, I need a good IP lawyer. Who is in the club? They try and keep it in-house. And everybody starts piling in, going, well, you need to speak so-and-so. And it's all within this community. Um, that's the spin-off. Now, do I take a do I make any money out of any business that results in that? No. That would be transactional. For me, it's 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 networking karma. Do good things, or right, there's an expression I love, which is "good things happen to good people." It's a bit woo woo. It's a bit hippie, but I hang my flag on that. Yeah, and what that catches is that sense of joy. You know, the, we as um, you know, many many women and many men like connecting with other people. They like the conversation. I'm I'm somebody who catches the train and then yabbers to the person next to me because I'm curious about where people I've are coming from where you. they're going to <laughs> what well, then I'm curious uh, yes <laughs> I know that you chat with the strangers on the train word has reached me mm. <laughs> but it's but I, I do enjoy that connection I think kind of once you take off um this artificial construct uh, that is going to this bizarre room and and going with an agenda that you're actually just going to meet somebody that you've maybe not talked to or see somebody you already know and strike up a conversation just just going. Oh, actually, that rewind, space. rewind there for a second because something else I say in the book is that network. We all network every day subconsciously. We don't know we're doing it, but every time you engage with another human being, you are networking. What your example of talking to strangers on the train. That train journey is a great networking opportunity, as are flights. Um, but talking at the school games, um, sports clubs, the gig rowing scene in the southwest, and that's all networking. Equally, social media is networking by another name because you're engaging. But it's a you've got people have to get away from this very um, defined small 
concept of it's going to an event to talk to people in a room to do an elevator pitch and swap a business card. I mean, it's not. Okay. That's probably okay. the worst kind. That, that's what gives networking a bad rap, certainly. Yeah, and sometimes you've got really formal networking groups. And I've not I've not been, but this is what I've heard, sort of second, third degree. But you've got some formal groups like the BNI who have a very tight um, uh, kind of agenda where there's a 10-minute mm. presentation, there's a, this one-minute pitch that goes around the room. And, and that does strike fear into kind of many people. Everybody should experience being a BNI meeting once in their lifetime, is my view. Um, I I had to go to B and I in a previous existence, so I do know about B and I. My um, it is very transactional. It's very structured. It's very structured. Um, so you can go to a B and I meeting anywhere in the world, and it will start at the same time and follow the same script and be exactly the same. It's like AA. I mean, it's familiar, you know. But it's it, let's put it right. It's not my cup of tea. However, if you are a plumber or an electrician and you're in a B and I chapter, you will do really well out of it. It's great for people like that, mm, and it's also yeah. very early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, we don't like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really early in the morning. <laughs> whoa, whoa. But uh, kind of if 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 that's one part of the spectrum, you know, mm-hmm. and actually there are there are other benefits because they. Um, require might be too strong a word but they urge their members to make referrals uh, yeah. to other members so it's it can be quite quite tight and then you've got uh, more um playful relationship based networks that are organized as as well um are there any other styles of networks that you've seen in a business sense um the BNI model has spun out other similar models whereby um, one of the Achilles heels of BNI is you can have three or four people in a chapter, as they call them, that genuinely get on. And it doesn't take them very long to work out that they could set up their own breakfast meeting, start a reasonable hour. It would be a lot more cost effective and more fun. Um, then you get traditional Chamber of Commerce, which have been around a very long time. They are... There's a place for them. They're a bit, you know, they, they, they conjure up images of lots of men in suits, and that still applies to a degree. They're a bit stiff, um, and they're a bit regimented in their approach. Um, there are women-only groups, and that's quite Marmite, because some women will really like that, others won't. Um, I, I'm, I don't have a strong opinion either way, personally. Um, within a sector like property and construction, the women's groups there, have a real purpose because they are so in the minority that there's mutual support. Um, I really, appro- I not approve, that sounds patronising, yeah. but I love those. And I, you know, I, I engage with them a lot. Um, but yeah, there are different, you know, there are different, but anyone could say, I would say, if you don't like the networking that is on offer in your neighbourhood, region, whatever, set up your own. Then you have total control. Um, it's not that time consuming. I mean, it can be, but at least you have control over it. But essentially, I like playful, I like fun, which is very much, I think it's probably a reflection of me, but it's very much at the heart of the, again, the Sampa culture. It would be playful, it would be fun, it would be supportive, relaxed. You know, if I mean, if you ever came to Sampa, if anyone came to a Sampa event or, a, a, you know, as a guest, and they went away saying I didn't have any fun, that was really miserable. I'd be mortified, you know. It'd be like, seriously, you could, I mean, what's wrong? You with didn't you? make it to the right table, <laughs> and kind of what's beautiful about the network is, uh, and again, uh, apologies to everybody, this is uh, an example of how a, a good network can work. Is um, you know, that you can just catch up with anybody else in the network and they will have that similar value set you know you won't be stuck in a safe conversation because you have this permission to be playful Mm -hmm. exploring what's going on curious creative it's it's just set the vibe yeah i think part of that stems from the fact that we are i hate the word but we are an invite group so you can't just join some a club you can express an interest but it will always start with you have um, a conversation or a coffee with me um and people always go is it vetting um that's a very 
it's a charged word. I, it's not something I like, but I always try and describe it along the lines of um, the All Black rugby team, whom I would, who I adore, or the Red Arrows. Both operate a no dickhead policy. It's as simple as that. We don't have dickheads, but I'm the arbiter of who's a dickhead. So it is people <laughs> like people like spending time with people like themselves who share their values. I think that's I think that's normal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, kind of one of the other networks that I wanted to uh, bring in at this point are internal networks within organisations. And particularly, you would mentioned women's networking groups and many large corporates have got networks of people in, in mm. similar dem demographics, whether they're parents, whether they're women, whether they're from different minority groups. And mm. those are a really good opportunity to find others um, to just explore that energy together but also to to have those informal conversations that help you to to learn and to grow absolutely networking so if we're talking about networking for career enhancement vis-a-vis -vis networking for business development then you need to be able to network into you're quite right internally both up and down and sideways but and you hear about water cool, water cooler moments um just just teams or colleagues who come together and have a cup of coffee together it's made more complicated now with the working hybrid working um so how many people are in at certain times which most organizations i speak to are still grappling with there's no precedent, so we're, we're you know we're all struggling along to find out what works. For me, the biggest issue with that is the juniors who learn their soft, you know, their social skills, their soft skills, whatever, by being around senior people, and that's not always happening anymore. Um, and what what's the answer? I don't know at the moment, but it's a it's a topic that really intrigues me. Mm. And there, are, for as many cons, there are many pros. So, for example, you can you can join any network globally because there are so many kind of online chapters of them. Oh. So, I, for example, <coughs> I'm a member of Sunfire, but I'm also a member of Singularity University, and we talk about you know, really cutting edge technology and um, and altruism impact on on the SDGs together. And I'm talking to people in. California and Berlin and Tokyo and, yeah. and just the vibrancy of those networks are strong in a way that you know you've, you've never really had as much access to in the past. No, that is where tech has just I mean transformational doesn't do it doesn't do it justice. And I like you, I am part of networks that take me global and we do it like this over Zoom. I you know, you know me quite well i'm not the biggest fan of tech so i don't tend to do that all the time but it gets you access to i mean just all this all this knowledge and all this experience and to like-minded people who are really happy to share that which is amazing um and equally for doing training or overcoming geography so i did a i did a, a workshop via zoom last week for children's hospital southwest you know 60 of their people all over the region all coming up but we do it on tech it's not as much fun for me but it's practical yeah 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 um so this is in the book you give like a there are lots and lots of practical tips um mm. and lots of encouragement within the book um, and you talk about the importance of likability could you just expand on that oh likability love likability um i was the cons oh well, i first came across likability um, it was a, it was a, it's a, it's a man called Tim Sanders in the States who wrote a couple of books, um, The Likeability Factor and Love is the Killer App, both of which I recommend hugely. And they're not difficult to read, but they made a huge impression on me. Um, likeability is, oh, it's this ethereal thing. It's a bit like sex appeal. You can say, to, you can say about someone, They've got sex appeal. No, they haven't. It's also subjective. But likability is, it's so much easier to get people to help you when you're nice, when you're likable. Some people are more likable than others. Can you, it's so, you know, is it, natu is, it in, is it natural or can you learn it? I think it's most, I think some people just 
more likable than others. But can you learn it? Yes, you can. And why is it important? It affects everything. Who you who decides to work with you, who decides to live with you, marry you, um, everything. It's and <clears throat> a really personal brand, which um, we might get into or not, but personal, you know, something, a strong personal brand would be along the lines of, if it was people, what are people saying about you in another room? If they just go, really nice guy, he's really fun. That's likable. That's really powerful. People want to hang out with people who are fun because we don't have enough fun. Again, I told you it's very simplistic. It's, you know, it's like no big theory here. Yeah, but... But what I, it's not big theory, but so often that sense of likeable is such a soft, it's seen as a soft, soft, soft skill. And it's mm. not hard business. So, you know, why do you want to be like, no, you've got to be this, you've got to be competitive, oh. you've got to, and it's just like, <laughs> no. It's coming away from that whereby I win, you lose. It's got to be, no, we can both walk away and we can both win from this. Um, my, all right, this has literally just come into my head right now, but I'm going to go with it. I think a lot of that sort of traditional stuff is men in suits, far too much testosterone and ego in the room, and it's just not healthy, um, which is why, and I'm not saying this because I'm on your podcast, it's, I will say this everywhere, I think women naturally collaborate much better than men, much and I think that different um and also I don't think it's a global phenomenon either because I I do see different approaches among different nationalities in terms of yeah. how much they share how much they disclose how much value is given to those um relationships uh even in kind of in, in discourse in, in working in business in the Middle East there's there's a how are you how are your family a, a kind of real depth because they're interested in a long-term relationship. You might get cut off quickly if you, you know, at times, but it's about long-term relationships oh. and understanding and trusting the person that you're dealing with. Absolutely. You just reminded me, my, my dad was a shell doctor and we were in Muscat in the Middle East. Um, and that business, you're quite right, of taking time for social intercourse before you start a business conversation, you know, not one cup of coffee, minimum two, probably three and asking about members of the family and being genuinely interested um and again we don't i don't think we do enough of that you know i think it should be one of your first questions how's the family but if you can ask that question actually you should actually know how many children there are and probably what they're called and, you know you should you, rather than just use it as a throwaway it's like yeah okay yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so do you see a shift in, in patterns of networks and how people approach networking to, you know, to be more embracing, to, to kind of create those connections far more than than before? Or is that because of um, the groups that you've selected into that you see that? It's all, I, think it, I think it's always been there. Interestingly, I think the southwest of UK, which is where we are, I think, puts far more emphasis on relationships vis-a-vis -vis transactional um you could argue that's because it's a slight it's not as fast paced as london um london is far more transactional in my experience it's you know jo -jo 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 -jo. um but i think i think again i think the importance of networking or having a network has been um, strengthened or that view has developed vis-a-vis -vis lockdown because you know being being locked down changed fundamentally so many things but being stuck at home without a network to draw upon was actually an eye-opener for a lot of people um mm. and you know and now with working from or hybrid working yeah it's important and I also before, think, sorry, oh, sorry, I was just about to say, I also think it's probably the most effective cost and everything way of business development there is. Now, be before I get into the, the absolutely key question of kind of what's your number one tip, I just, I can't resist asking this question. Um, 
in the book again, kind of you mentioned glamour networking, and for many of our readers, <laughs> what is glamour networking? It sounds fantastic. I, I, I think we want some. I'm not sure. <laughs> Tell us more. Uh, I think I know what you're referring to. Um, <laughs> In in my career, there was a period where I was heavily involved in a supporting role to the TV and film industry. So that involved going to the American film market, going to Cannes Film Festival, um, going to all of openings and things, which is um, perceived to be very glamorous. The reality is it's not at all. It's actually really hard work and boring. But glamour networking. So, for instance, um, a good example would have been The Concord. Sorely missed and loved. Sorry to all the climate people, but in our world of, I used to work in international career, so to us it was so useful. But by definition, the best networking in the world because there were only fifty seats on the damn thing. So whoever or hundred, who and in seats of twos. So whoever you sat next to, by definition, would be really interesting, and you had them for three hours. Or you know, it was just glamour networking, just. Openings, award nights is glamour network. I mean, the probably the one that's most appropriate to all of to all of us these days is going to award ceremonies. I love an award ceremony, less so for the awards, but because it's a chance to get dressed up, lots of people in one place. Um, you have a few shandies, um, but everyone's there. Um, that's glamour networking. That'd be a good example. Yeah, and also you make me think about the different um, award ceremonies I've I've been to. You, there's naturally so many opportunities to strike up a conversation with a with a stranger, whether it's um, you know complimenting them on their dress or you know kind of asking them you know who they're here with or you know, what they think of X. There's there's yeah. those natural opportunities just to spark up a conversation and make the small talk that then starts to lead into absolutely. Into You'll be you know bump into them at the bar you will bump into them at the toilet. Ladies, probably more so, because you might be doing makeup and things. You know, we're a bit more pragmatic about it. But equally, or stuck in a queue. <laughs> oh, yeah, or stuck in a queue. I personally, like, you know, I like to table hop. I like to table hop at awards. You know, people have said, John, have you got a weak bladder? Because you're always getting up to go to the loo. No, I'm getting up to walk through that room. My excuse is to go to the loo, but it's an excuse to walk through the tables. And just wave at people and stop. So, oh, no. Again, before we get to the killer question, which is the number one tip, I'm going to ask you this one. Um, that seems like a brilliant tip in, in terms of how you stop a conversation with somebody that you really don't want to talk to politely. <laughs> because, yeah, we've all been in a room and we've kind of been like, Yes, yes, I, I don't like you. I don't feel comfortable. We haven't got much in common, but I want to speak to other people please <laughs> oh it's so hard um it's it's linked to one of the most common questions i get asked will be how do you start a conversation with a stranger but then following from that will be how do you exact as you've just asked how do you extract yourself from someone who you know there, there might be a really good reason why they're standing on the rent because they are really boring um i think my key message would be you have to do it with grace and compassion. Um, you can't just leave them hanging. Um, and it's it, it's not difficult. You just say to them, listen, I could, you know, you can lie, bare face lie. You can go, I could talk to you all night, but you know, if it's a networking event, but I've got a lot of people here that I need to catch up with. Let me, let me take you, let me introduce you to someone and go and off, take them and offload them onto someone else. Or... Is there anybody here that you specifically want to meet, or what kind of people? Because I'm going to run into them. I can send them over to you. There is a there's a there's there's nice there's a nice way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Or you could yeah, just go great. talk to the hand and walk away. You know. <laughs> Excuse me, I need to leave. Uh, oh no! See now that oh, okay. <laughs> That is one of my two pet, my, my pet hates is Excuse me, I need the loo, or I'm just going to get another drink. It's lame. It's lazy. And when you're talking to someone and they're looking over your shoulder to see if they're more interesting, that's just so bad, so oh, bad. 
old dear. No, the actually kind of the networking fails are much more fun to talk about. They are. <laughs> just they are just, so just don't do fun. that. Don't do that. You're okay. Just don't do that. Because um, yeah, they're looking over people's shoulders or only speaking to the most or the perceived most important person in the room. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we, huge we mistake. Say, we say it all the time. You know, it's great. Yeah, and some of the conferences that I've been to, they they have the pop up introductions. And you know, for example, I I met a fifteen year old at a tech conference, and it was a strange link. But it was like, okay, well, let's start to share, let's start to explore. And she'd actually been connected with the organizer for three years, and so was an absolute rising star in technology. Mm. You know, her address book on her phone was amazing. But if you'd gone into the conversation with a, oh, why on earth am I talking to a 15-year-old? This is a waste of time. Put it off. You would never get there. You would never Preconceptions. Preconceptions mm. and assumptions. You can't have them. You have got to be absolutely open-minded. Um, you, ha- you have to be naturally curious. Um, I, you know, I get asked, John, if you're talking to sit down or if I arrange a coffee with someone, do I have an agenda? Never. I just want to go and talk to them. Um, and on that last point you made, I remember sitting next to a lawyer who was a partner and he at uh, a chamber of breakfast. And he went, John, I'm so glad I'm sitting next to you because normally I'm sitting next to somebody who's really boring, will never be a client of my company. And I'm going, I kind of hear you, but they may not be a client of your company, but their dad, they might be selling his company, for instance. You're not getting that work now because you have just absolutely dismissed them. You just, you just don't know. And also, it's just good manners to give someone the time and, you know, space. That's yeah, it. for sure. For sure. And I think um, what, you've, what you've triggered in me is, um, is approaches to things like LinkedIn and your networks that are there. And because I've been to a global university, uh, I teach for a global university as well. So I have a range of different people that come in and out of my life. And so my LinkedIn connections you know they're, they're vast it's about three thousand people who I just because I love talking to people and then we connect and then we follow up but I Ooh. often forget to loop back round to people and I graduated uh, with my MBA over 10 years ago now but when I when I you know kind of reach out to somebody and I haven't spoken to them for that time because we'd had such a warm connection and a conversation it feels like you're catching up with an old friend not you know, somebody who's in your address book. <laughs> that's so that's a lovely point because yeah, it should be, and equally, that's the biggest. Com- that's one of the best compliments I've ever heard about Sapphire Club from someone who came as a guest. They went, "John, it's like it's like a bunch of friends just getting together." And they went, "Thank you, you know, that's lovely to hear." <laughs> so we're going to wrap up with one tip. If you could only have one tip, or you know, uh, I think Tim Ferriss says, if you could have one billboard on the side of a motorway, yeah. uh, which would be around networking, what would you want to put on that billboard? Um, I think, oh, I'll give you a serious one and then a funny one. Serious one would be networking without strategy is pointless. Most people have no strategy with their network it has to be strategic well whatever reason you're using it for business development career enhancement it needs to be it needs to be strategic so a question i like to ask organizations is do you have a networking plan that is written down and reviewed regularly and the answer is always no and then go you've got a business plan you've got a marketing plan i can help you do this it would be how are you going to measure it you know so that would be it needs to be strategic above all else it needs to be strategic um just a fun throwaway tip though if you are going to awards dinners or charity dinners anywhere where there is a table plan always take a photograph of it on your phone and then when you are sitting at your table you can work out who's in the room what table they're on where they are which so when i go on my table hopping excursions i already know where they are and i'll send the messages going i know you're on table late stand up because i can't see you because i'm coming in a minute um and equally, you've got afterwards, as a point of reference, you've got, it's like a delegate list. It was in the room. And it's so simple. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's a golden one. Thank you. I, yeah, 
I, I think we've definitely peaked <laughs> for now. <laughs> oh, dear. so John, how can how can people find out more ending? about you? Well, it. <laughs> Sorry, oh, you can goodness. edit that out. I am now blushing outrageously. Um, but how do people find out more about you, about your book, about uh, the Sunfire Club? Okay. Uh, the Sunfire Club has a website, sunfireclub.com, um, which is about to um, about to change, actually. Not the, not the DOM, but the new website is about to go live in the next few weeks. Um, much improved. Um, I'm really, really hard to get a hold of, obviously, because I'm complete tart. So I am big on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I am also on Instagram, John Harvey Guru. Apologies. John Harvey Guru. So I'm big on Instagram. Um, don't use Facebook very much anymore. Um, I am on Twitter, but I tend not to use it anymore. Um, but LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn. And if you send me a LinkedIn request, I will always acknowledge it and I will normally connect. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And of course, do look out for the book available from all oh, good Oh, sorry, yes, the book is available on Amazon <laughs> or the SoundCloud Club website. Yes. And if you buy the book, please leave a review. Brilliant. We'll make sure that there's a link in the show notes uh, for for you all. And I really, I hope that everybody listening in has got a lot from the conversation. Every time I do talk with John, um, which is not nearly enough, but I would second that. We don't talk enough. But it's always fun and insightful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, And so there's a lot of wealth in what John has shared um, today. And as a woman who's built up my own career, who's pivoted between industries and then between corporate and self-employed, I really understand how important it is to build relationships. And it's not always um, in that business sense, especially if you're self-employed. Often it's around those social needs that you've got and how you can improve. Was it the five people that you're hanging out with most and keep raising your aspirations by by getting out there, meeting new people and forging genuine relationships. And, yeah, that's, that's what networking is, hey? I couldn't have put it better myself. That's a lovely way to work. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for inviting me on. It's been a joy. Hey, fabulous. Well, um, until next time, guys, uh, please like, rate, subscribe, um, share the podcast episode we cover a whole range of topics and it's it's fantastic um that we've been able to get towards the career oriented the professional oriented a little bit here um it's still very much around your mindset and your approach um but we do cover all manner of topics so please keep tuned for the next episodes and we'll see you again soon thanks thanks john see you Cheers. thanks very much thank you for listening we'd love to hear your comments and feedback And if you've enjoyed it, please click on that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up and feel free to share. Join us for our next episode of the Exponential Potential podcast. Ignite your potential and thrive in times of great change.